Hello, my name is Wesley Wallace, and today for the RU Tartan, I'll be speaking with Davis Sperling. He's the Assistant Director of Academic Advising for the College of Education and Human Development here at Radford University. How are you today? Pretty good. How are you doing, Wes? I'm doing great. And one of the things that I wanted to ask you before we begin is now that we're already three weeks into the spring 2021 semester, um, how is your spring semester going so far? And what are some things that you've enjoyed so far early on within the semester? Um, things are going well. I'm definitely, um, you know, enjoying having students back on campus. Um, you know, I'm hopeful we're kind of we're kind of transitioning back towards things getting more normal, you know, kind of having more activities on campus and things like that. Um, but things are going well. Um, you know, it, we we had the first week of ad drop and everything. We haven't really gotten to registration yet. Um, so we're just kind of, you know, early on in the semester. So keeping an eye on students, um, you know, helping them with any, you know, coursework, I mean, any um, resources or things like that on campus they may need, like the Harvey Knowledge Center and things like that. And one of the things that I was excited about for this interview is just the fact of understanding what an academic advisor does and how they assist uh, college students throughout their educational journey. Um, yeah. For my first question, I wanted to ask you, um, Higher Ed Jobs, which is the leading online website for jobs and career information in academia, published an article on July 15, 2013, titled Top Traits of an Academic Advisor. Joshua Smith, Loyola University's Dean for the School of Education, discussed the top qualities that will help academic advisors to be successful in their roles by saying, an academic advisor does more than tell a student where the bookstore is or which class to enroll. An advisor is, resp is responsible for supporting students and partnering with them so that they can make informed decisions and create the right goals in order to excel. So I want to ask you, as the Assistant Director of Advising for the College of Education and Human Development, how do you find the time in your weekly schedule to support students so that they can make informed decisions and create the right goals when you advise a caseload of 150 students, um, you teach various first year experience courses, and you also assist with a quest orientation program. So how do you find the time to basically um, assist RU students for um, academic advising? Yeah, so first and foremost, I would say, you know, definitely time management, um, definitely just needing to stay on task. Um, you know, if I'm working on something in particular, if I'm working on like graduation letters or whatever I might be helping with at the time, I'm um, just making sure I'm staying on task and being efficient with whatever I may be doing, making sure I'm staying on top of the deadlines, things like that. Um, you know, obviously reminding students of certain deadlines, like withdrawal deadlines, end of ad drop week and things like that. Um, and I definitely think case management, which is something we um, emphasize in the College of Education and Human Development is a, is a great way to kind of balance all of those different things while also making sure um, students are getting the individualized attention they need. Yeah. Um, you know, every, every student is different and kind of requires varying levels of support and assistance. Um, and it's kind of important to decipher exactly what a student's needs might be um, and making sure I'm fulfilling, um, fulfilling these needs and assisting them in any way they may need. Um, you know, we have students that come into advising appointments, you know, already classes picked out, um, you know, they're fine, they don't need any help. And then, you know, there's students that come in and, you know, may, may need a little more support and guidance and things like that. So I definitely think it's important, um, you know, case management helps with kind of individualizing that attention um, and making sure each student's advising experience, experience is tailored to them and making sure it's meeting their specific needs. Um, and it kind of, you know, like I said, the case management allows me to um, making sure each student, making sure each student's needs are met, whether they're academic, social, or, you know, personal matters. Um, Cause certainly if I'm not able to help them with whatever um, their need may be, I can definitely point them in the right direction on campus and making sure they're getting that need fulfilled. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, and I think um, one, you know, to, to kind of go off of that, there's two parts of the question I kind of would like to um, build upon. So like one, obviously, you know, Quest is done primarily over the summer. Um, so I definitely think that's very much easy to support our incoming students and our, you know, soon to be freshman students and first year students and transfer stu first semester transfer students and things like that. Um, that's able to be easier supported over the summer, obviously, because um, a majority of students don't take summer courses. Um, so, you know, advising isn't as um, intense over the summer, you know, we're kind of answering questions through emails and things like that. Um, you know, we may have students come in here and there, but a lot of our focus over summer is on quests and, and is on those incoming students. Absolutely. And I liked how you talked about how it's tailored to each individual student because each student is different based on their specific needs because each person is different. Exactly, exactly. And I think something else that kind of helps with um, you know, kind of balancing those things and also has, supports case management um, is I think there's a lot of overlap between those first year experience courses that I do teach and the case management. 
Mm -hmm. um, the majority of the students in my University 100 and my in, in my University 150 classes are also my advisees. Um, so I'm kind of able to support them and you know understand further what their needs are in the classroom, um, which makes you know advising appointments and things like that um, you know go even smoother because I already kind of know their needs and I'm able to um, appropriately address them and um, you know help them with whatever they may need. Absolutely. And for my next question, I want to ask you, um, this is in regards to the impact COVID-19 has had, particularly on the U.S. higher education system. Yeah. In September of 2020, Roy Matthew, Deloitte Consulting's national practice leader in higher education, spoke with Yahoo Finance about the impact COVID-19 has had on the United States education system by saying, the financial impact is real. A lot of universities, publics, privates, whether you're large, medium, or small, you're taking a financial hit. It's not on the enrollment side, it's on the auxiliaries. Matthew continued by saying, the quality of education has also changed. Well, we could all sit here and say, great, we figured out how online learning works. Faculty and students are interacting, the experience is still not that great or not that great how it used to be before. So I wanted to ask you, while working in the College of Education and Human Development, what challenges or obstacles did COVID-19 give you during the fall 2020 semester? And how does the Center for Academic Advising and Student Support plan to overcome these challenges uh, during the current spring semester? Um, well, thankfully, um, you know, due to everything kind of switching on um, virtual last year, I actually do feel like we were able to um, very much prepare for the fall 2020 semester and kind of go into it with a game plan. Um, you know, kind of understanding what the COVID restrictions and things like that would be on campus. Um, the majority of challenges and real and challenges we um, faced um, were mainly created by COVID-19 protocols and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, since the state and the university obviously have um, specific COVID um, protocols in place, you know, with social distancing, masking requirements, and things like that. Um, you know, and we're having to socially distance in classrooms and offices. Um, I feel like we were kind of able to overcome that by offering a variety of different appointment types and things like that. Um, through our advising appointments or, um, you know, whenever students are coming in. Um, essentially, you know, we, our offices were deemed too small um, due to social distancing and things like that. So we actually were unable to have students in our offices. Yeah. Um, so obviously that in itself created a challenge because um, the majority of our advising appointments used to be done, you know, me standing, sitting at my desk right here and having a student and, you know, helping them and kind of helping them with whatever they need, you know, face to face like that. Um, but we, you know, we understand every student still has those unique needs and, you know, every student may not um, benefit the most from like a Zoom appointment or things like that. Um, so we all, we were, we were still careful to offer um, Zoom, phone and in-person appointments. Um, we offered all three, I um, mean, you know, depending on what the student wanted to do um, or what they were able to do if they were having a quarantine or something like that. Um, and, you know, if a student did come in for an in-person appointment, we just um, went to a conference room, made sure socially dis distant to make sure, um, you know, everyone was following masking requirements and things like that. Um, so I feel like we were able to kind of overcome a lot of those challenges that the COVID protocols um, created just by, you know, planning and kind of being very strategic with what we were doing. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously um, another important point I wanted to hit, um, we were able to overcome a lot of the challenges that created in classrooms thanks to the amazing support from the IT Center on campus and Radford University as a whole, yeah. um, kind, of making, kind of making every classroom um, student compatible. Um, you know, because I think, you know, a lot of students were having the quarantine, um, you know, some students were missing a week, maybe two weeks, um, whether they tested positive or not, or whether they were just having to, uh, or whether they were just exposed to COVID. Um, but that, that made it really easy because, you know, students were missing a beat in class, they were able to zoom in class and, um, you know, kind of get on um, the same experience they would if they were um, in terms of the lecture and presentation and everything. Um, so I think that, you know, helped a lot with overcoming some of those challenges. I think another th important part was, um, you know, having really, uh, you know, we always have good communication with faculty and other offices um, mm -hmm. and even more important during COVID. Um, and I'm thinking specifically on, you know, how we would handle a lot of our office functions, like, you know, course withdrawals, change of majors and things like that. Um, you know, obviously it, it used to be a student or prior to COVID, a student would, you know, they would come in and meet with us. Um, they would fill out, you know, withdrawal form, change of major form, whatever they were, they were getting assistance with. Um, and then they would typically take the form and walk it to the appropriate office where it needed to be turned in. Mm -hmm. Um, but obviously with COVID, we had, we were not unable to do, um, you know, a lot of paper documents and things like that. Um, so we streamlined a lot of our um, operations by kind of through email, um, emailing those specific offices, or if we needed, you know, assistance from a faculty or whatever, maybe. Um, so I definitely think just, you know, emphasizing important communication with faculty and other offices. Um, and again, you know, something that we did even prior to COVID, but became even more important as a result of COVID 
um, but it's just knowing academic policy um, to help students make informed decisions um, about whatever they, wherever situation they were at with their classes or even outside of their classes. Um, you know, it, it proved even more useful, especially I'm thinking last semester when the withdrawal deadline got pushed back, for example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that that really helped students and um, it really gave them a chance to make an informed decision on, you know, if they felt like um, they could be successful and pass the class or not, or if, um, or if you know, they, the best decision may have been to withdraw from the class. Um, so overall, you know, COVID-19 definitely did bring about some challenges, um, especially with the protocols and things like that. Um, but I feel like we were kind of able to easily adapt to a lot of those challenges with um, you know, appropriate communication and good and um, strategic planning going into the semester. And I also wanted to ask you, um, on June 12th, just last summer, 2020, Radford University's Board of Visitors passed a resolution that would authorize President Hemphill to undertake reduction strategies that respond to the fiscal impact that was created by the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, additionally, the resolution declared that the established guidelines outlined in the Teaching and Research Faculty Handbook as inapplicable. The decision effectively removed faculty members' ability to file appeals and grievances. It also ended protect protections for tenured professors by allowing a reduction of the workforce under fiscal extingency and due to program restructuring or discontinuance. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor and Statistics, academic advisors earned an average salary of $61,000 a year in May of 2019. This included adv advisors of all levels, where the lowest earners made less than $34,380, and the top paid advisors received over $96,090. After working at Radford University for two years as an assistant director of academic advising, what will you do to increase or maintain your job security during the pandemic? And do you consider yourself as an asset to the College of Education and why? So kind of tackling your question kind of piece by piece here. Um, so first, like here at Radford University and you know at any college or university, um, advising is really a critical piece to student success. Um, you know, as professional advisors, I truly feel um, I feel like the university feels that we um, play an essential role in students' transition from high school to, um, to being successful here at Radford. I mean, most first-year students here at Radford stay with a professional advisor for their first year to two years or so, depending on the college, depending on the program, things like that, um, before being transitioned to a faculty advisor. Um, and this is done to ensure that students are able to, you know, adequately navigate um, Radford's um, uh, navigate their courses, um, and, as well as Radford's resources and things like that. Um, before they enter their upper level coursework um, of their major. Um, I certainly consider myself an asset to the College of Education and Human Development. I think I bring a lot to the table in kind of a, a few different ways. Um, you know, first and foremost, I believe that, you know, as a recent graduate, having graduated from Radford myself um, in 2017, um, I feel like that I have a relevant perspective on, you know, what the Radford University student experience entails, um, as well as challenges, successes, um, and things like that, um, that a Radford student may experience. Um, so with this, mind, with this in mind, this only enhances my ability to um, advise Radford University students because I kind of understand, um, you know, what the Radford University student is, um, but right. also allows me to provide insight into, you know, different committees um, and, you know, planning strategic committees and things like that that I'm on um, when discussing academic policy or, you know, implementing programs or different things like that. I feel like I'm very much able to advocate for what the Radford University student needs, wants, um, and things like that. In, while working in the College of Education and Human Development, how would you describe the collaboration process among your peers and other staff members who work within the college? Um, what's that creative environment like and how do you guys um, you, you bounce ideas off of each other and work together as a team? Um, I, I really think, you know, and I, um, I really think here, here at the College of Education and Human Development, we have kind of a, the model advising center as well as the model, model college on campus. You know, I love the relationship we have with our um, faculty as well as the other advisors here on campus. Um, obviously, you know, with COVID and things like that, it's created a little, little more um, challenges and things like that. Um, but, you know, it's a, especially for some of our programs, um, the feed of like graduate programs, like when I'm thinking of like allied health sciences and things like that. You know, if we have a student interested in, you know, like physical therapy or occupational therapy, um, it's really as simple as, you know, walking that student down the hallway um, and introducing them to a, a um, faculty member who, you know, is, is, has experience in that field, has been in that field, kind of knows the ins and, that, ins and outs, you know, that helps them with giving them a rundown to make sure um, it's something that that student does want to do and that um, faculty member is able to kind of help that student, um, you know, kind of understand, you know, why, how their undergraduate experience will translate into that graduate program. Mm -hmm. um, I really think we, we do a great job at, at our college of collaborating and working together. 
um, and you know, kind of making sure we're there for each other and supporting each other um, to ultimately benefit the Radford student. Because I feel like the Radford student experience, um, you know, is ultimately the you know, ensuring students go from um, being a successful student here to graduating um, is really the ultimate goal of our college and you know, Radford University as a whole. Um, but I really feel like we have that that very focused here at our college. Um, and kind of going back to what you're um, saying about uh, or what you're asking about me being an asset um, to the college, mm -hmm. um, I also feel like you know. I have a good balance of kind of having a few years of experience, you know, having started here in 2018, um, coupled with, you know, my, or if I, I like to perceive as my youthfulness, um, kind of perceive, uh, provides a experience perspective, but also um, kind of has some new ideas in my job. Um, so I think, I feel like I'm also always pushing myself to better um, and ways to improve myself um, professionally. Um, you know, for example, I attended a Nakata conference um, last, last year before COVID hit. Mm -hmm. um, and then choosing to pursue and complete the professional writing certificate program here at Radford. Um, I completed this, pro this program this last month um, and I can already, I've already seen the last year um, the impact it's had on like my technical writing ability as well as my um, knowledge of document design and presentation. Um, and I feel like this even further enhanced my ability to effectively communicate with Radford students. Um, so I really feel like, you know, I'm, I, I definitely consider myself an asset within the college and I really feel like um, within our college, we, you know, are, are always collaborating and always, um, trying to just make the experience the best we can for the Radford student and supporting them. And I also wanted to ask you, um, while attending Radford University from 2013 to 2017, um, you actually acquired your Bachelor of, you know, of Arts in History and Political Science. Um, according to Radford University's History Department website, the department states that history majors learn not just about the past and its relevance to today, but they also learn to think, write, and speak analytically and develop analytical skills that may be applied in many careers. Um, according to Radford University's political science department website, many employers hire liberal arts majors over, their other, over other majors because their educational background makes them easy to train and their knowledge of history and culture assist them in dealing with clients and dealing with new market trends. So I wanted to ask you, um, why did you decide to apply to Radford University? And did you think studying history and political science would increase your employment opportunities um, since they offer a plethora of professional skills? Or were you genuinely interested in learning about history in American government? Um, so again, kind of tackling your, your questions kind of in, in order here. Um, so I guess first, you know, coming out of high school, I knew that I wanted to attend an in-state school. Um, I definitely did not want to pay out-of-state tuition. Um, and in, in Virginia, I feel like we have a, a collection of really great public universities. Um, so I wasn't sure exactly which one I wanted to go to immediately coming out of high school. Um, I had mm -hmm. applied to about five or six different schools um, and had been accepted to or waitlisted to all but one of them. Um, but the reason I actually ended up applying and specifically choosing to attend Bradford um, was I just love the look of the campus as well as the size of it. Um, you know, while every student is different, I really, I truly feel that Radford's size um, as a medium-sized institution um, was large enough to have diverse programs and perspectives and things like that, um, but also uh, small enough to still have that amazing student-to-faculty experience. Um, so I think this, you know, at the time I was undecided, or additionally at the time I was, um, uh, you know, pre-major undecided coming into the uh, coming into the college. Mm -hmm. um, so the diverse programs also um, kind of in, enticed me to come here because I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do at the time. Um, you know, and for me, like I said, Radford University provided such a perfect student faculty ratio where I felt like I was not just a number, um, but my faculty truly cared about me and kind of wanted to push me to do better. Um, you know, this began as early as my first semester, really. Um, you know, my first semester, I was asked to be a note taker um, for some of my classes. And especially I'm thinking back to my University 100 course, actually. Um, when my faculty or faculty instructor, um, Dr. C. Lurch, had actually encouraged me to apply to be a peer instructor myself, um, you know, after the class was over. Um, because for those unfamiliar, um, University 100 is taught by a peer instructor and then a faculty instructor. Mm -hmm. um, and peer instructor is, you know, kind of like a student mentor and kind of meant to um, support the faculty instructor and, you know, kind of give that student perspective, give that student experience. Um, so I truly believe that the faculty at Radford have the student's best interest at heart. Um, they're always encouraging and supporting students in any way they can. Um, to kind of get into your second part of the question, though, about kind of why I chose history and political science, um, you know, so I, I pursued both um, to inc increase my employment as well as graduate school opportunities. Um, so I, I kind of, and as well as a genuine interest in both subjects. Um, you know, like I said, I began my first few weeks as a pre-major, um, and I actually ended up selecting political science just because I had a really great um, experience with my government courses in high school. Um, 
And, you know, once I did declare a major in political science, I was assigned a faculty advisor who very much, I feel like, kind of shaped uh, my life here at Radford and, you know, for the better. And I very much benefited from having him as a faculty advisor. Um, you know, when I had my first uh, advising appointment with Dr. Sharif, um, I kind of came in um, and he kind of broke down, you know, the credits required for graduation, um, the credits required for my major, the credits required for core curriculum and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. Essentially, you know, students at Radford are required to have 120 credits to graduate. Um, and he broke down, you know, your core curriculum here is, and, you know, the core curriculum has since changed, so this is a little outdated. Um, but your core curriculum, you know, makes up about 40 or so credits. Um, your political science major makes up about 40 or so credits. Um, so he essentially asked me, you know, what are you going to do with those additional 40 credits? Um, and, you know, he, he kind of um, encouraged me to think about it, you know, kind of research and eventually add. Um, you know, a minor, a major, you know, something to fulfill those 40 credits. Yeah. Um, so I wasn't just taking, you know, kind of random elective courses and things like that. Um, so that actually is what led me to declare a second major in history um, as a complement to my political science major. Um, and I can't, I can't remember if I actually mentioned this, um, you know, a few sentences ago, um, but part of the reason I chose political science initially too was um, I had interest in like social science graduate programs, as well as um, I had thought about going to law school at the time. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, political science is kind of a, is a strong major for that, and then history kind of seems like a natural fit um, next to it because both are great majors um, for law school or any of those social science um, graduate programs I may have been interested in. So I kind of did it to make myself a stronger candidate as well as um, interest because I always liked government and history in high school. Mm -hmm. um, so I did believe that both programs would enhance my ability to think critically about subject matter um, as well as um, you know greatly enhance my ability to um, think, write, and speak analytically. Um, right. Which which I feel like are skills not only applicable to those graduate programs or law schools or whatever I was interested in, um, but also, you know, a variety of different career fields. So I felt like, um, you know, the, since I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do in terms of my career, um, I feel like those, those majors were kind of in the realm of what I want to do and, you know, would greatly benefit me and were teaching me skills that I feel like would benefit me no matter which direction I went in. Mm -hmm. um, and I did love the faculty that I had in both those programs. Um, they, you know, like I've kind of said throughout, um, they definitely pushed me and encouraged me um, and supported me in pretty much every way they could. Um, you know, some of my, you know, best experiences in classes were in classrooms were in, you know, Dr. Munzinger's, Dr. Corbin's, Dr. Shreef's, um, or Mr. Ryder's courses, and, you know, several others. Um, but I really wouldn't trade those skills or experiences I had in those courses for pretty much anything. Um, and, you know, actually, Dr. Shreef, um, last year prior to, to COVID, um, you know, kind of breaking out fully and everything, had asked me actually to be um, one of the guest speakers for the political science um, department's poli, poli side days. Mm -hmm. um, people have heard that at some point on campus. So I was, you know, obviously did that. Um, and I was very thankful to be able to do that because that was kind of one of the flag flagship experiences I, you know, was talking about previously that kind of, um, you know, really much made my undergraduate experience. And so I was very thankful to be able to do that to kind of give back. Um, to the current students. And looking back, which one, now that you work in higher education, um, do you think you would ever, now that you're in higher education, do you think you probably would have still enjoyed law school if you hadn't gone that path? Or do you think this is kind of like your calling? Yeah, I, and um, you know, it, it kind of has to do with um, kind of the leadership experiences I had as an undergraduate student. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, I, I don't think I would be unhappy and, you know, at law school necessarily, um, but I definitely think I, you know, higher education is my passion and kind of my calling. Um, you know, I didn't even know prior to coming to Radford that higher education was even like a career field or a career tra trajectory you could go on. Um, right. You know, I'm very thankful for the experiences I had at Radford because, like I said, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. Um, but I feel like, you know, through my coursework, through my um, experiences on campus and things like that, uh, it very much steered me in, in the career path that I, you know, I'm happiest in. And I also, I, I like the thing I'm, you know, made for and, um, and can provide the most help in. And I wanted to ask you, um, hold on, let me get to the question. Oh, got it. So UVA School of Education and Human Development is the 15th ranked school of education. Um, furthermore, graduates from UVA school have gone on to be leaders and innovators in a variety of fields from education to health scientists, to entrepreneurs, and even to researchers. Um, after graduating from Radford University, you attended UVA from 2017 to 2018, and you acquired your master's of education in higher education in higher education administration. Um, so I wanted to ask you, UVA has established a reputation of being the flagship University of Virginia. Um, the institution has a 26% acceptance rate, a 94% graduation rate, and a student population of around 21,985 students. 
When you compare UVA's School of Education Human Development with Radford's College of Education Human Development, what similarities and differences do you see and how can Radford's College of Education Human Development reach the same level of success, I guess you could say, or same level of notoriety or representation as UVA school while maintaining its own individuality? Yeah, so again, kind of you know, breaking down your questions um, kind of chronologically. Um, so I think first, it's, it's kind of a difficult question to answer. Um, and the main reason is, or like two reasons, I guess. Um, so one, my experiences at both universities were pretty different. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at, at Radford University, I was an undergraduate student for four years, and I, this is now my third year working here. Um, whereas at the University of Virginia, I was a graduate student and was only there for a year. Um, it was a year-long program, so went, you know, summer, fall, spring. Um, and I also think the universities are just very different. Um, like, and the, the student population as a result is different. Um, you know, Radford University is a medium-sized medium public liberal arts um, institution, whereas UVA is a large-sized um, public research university. And so I feel like these differences alone create very student, very different student populations. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as such, you know, those students have different student, student experiences, such as like student-to-faculty ratio, for example. Um, you know, most of my courses at Radford had probably around 15 to 30 students or so. Um, there were definitely, you know, a few like, you know, lab science courses and things like that that had more. Um, but the majority of my classes, I would say, were in that range of 15 to 30 students. Um, and definitely on the lower end for my upper level, like in major coursework. Um, whereas uh, my course at UVA had anywhere from like 20 to 50 people for graduate courses. Um, so I definitely think, um, to kind of answer your, your question, um, you know, one major difference obviously is the, is the student to faculty ratio. Um, you know, I mentioned that earlier, but that is one of my favorite things about Radford is I do feel like the, the size of our institution very much creates um, a great student experience where student, students are, you know, faculty are able to adequately support all of our students um, and making sure they're making the most out of their experience. Um, you know, similar to Radford University, UVA did have great faculty, though, and supported me throughout my courses and be, beyond. Um, you know, definitely in my UVA grad program, I had a lot of amazing experiences within the class, just within the classroom, just like I did here at Radford University. Um, you know, one that kind of comes to mind was um, one of my first classes there. You know, we kind of designed our own made up university um, and gave a comprehensive overview of it. And it very much reminded me of a, um, you know, amazing, unforgettable experience I had here at Radford University and one of Dr. Corbin's um, in her congressional or political science congressional class, um, where essentially we were assigned house or, or I think we chose them, but um, we were house of representative members um, and kind of acted out a legislative, legislative simulation. Um, so I, you know, I definitely think those kind of flagship experiences that really, um, you know, were more than just reading books, were more than just learning, were very much experiential learning. Um, I think those were really great at both universities. Um, and kind of getting to the second part of your question, I don't necessarily think Bradford's um, College of Education and Human Development um, has to do anything necessarily to reach the same level of success as UVA, as I feel like our college is already very successful um, with everything we do. You know, our, I feel like, and I, I can't remember if I mentioned this earlier, but I do feel like our college um, it is kind of the model college and advising center on campus in terms of the support we provide, in terms of our, you know, the support our faculty give. Um, you know, we have remarkable faculty in this college, and I feel like our, our center does provide amazing support. I um, mean, you know, the dean of our college, Dr. Tamara Wallace, um, you know, always has the best uh, students' best interests at heart and will always advocate for them. Um, and, you know, as a former educator herself, she very much understands the importance of experiential learning. Right. Which, which I do feel like is kind of, um, you know, one of the flagships of our college, you know regardless of which um, program you're in our college, you get some type of internship or some type of field experience, um, whether you're in health and need performance, whether you're in um, teacher education, um, or whether you're in recreation, parks, and tourism. Um, you know, we have a variety of accredited programs that produce some of the best teachers across the state here from Radford. Um, and then our other programs, um, you know, like I said, health and performance, recreation, parks, and tourism, and even counselor education, if you're including the graduate programs. Um, I feel like all of those programs have top-notch faculty and provide um, amazing experiential learning, um, which, which more than prepares students for their professional fields. Um, so yeah, I, I, I just think, I think a lot of the differences are attributed to the difference of the institutions and thus the different student populations. Um, mm -hmm. But really, I really do feel like both um, un the University of Virginia's School of Education and Human Development and Radford's College of Education and Human Development um, both provide amazing experiential learning opportunities um, for their students. Where would you say you see Radford's College of Education Human Development going in the near future? Um, do, do you predict or anticipate any changes, any, uh, let's say, innovations or things to expand the college uh, down the years as the university keeps um, progressing for the future years to come? Um, you know, I, I, 
I don't, I can't, I feel like I can't talk a lot a ton about program expansion. I know, um, you know, we're always working to um, keep our programs accredited and kind of making sure, um, you know, we're able to put them to the next level. Um, you know, for example, one thing, that, one example that comes to mind um, is recently we had, you know, the allied health sciences and sport management programs. Mm -hmm. um, those have actually become, they used to be concentrations because um, they were accredited to be within a concentration, um, but they've recently become accredited to be their own major here within the College of Education and Development at Radford. Um, so now we have, you know, the allied health sciences major and the sport administration majors, you know, not just concentrations. Um, so I do feel like we're always, you know, pushing ourselves to making sure, um, you know, our pro we're on top of our programs and they're, um, you know, kind of a a in tune with um, what national standards are and things like that. Right. Um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, I truly feel like our faculty are always, um, you know, just push, pushing their classes and programs to be the best they can be. And in addition to helping students on your day-to-day -day, uh, job, how would you say you stay creatively fulfilled within your career? And what are some things that you hope to accomplish outside of academic advising? Um, so to be creatively fulfilled, so like, I mean, like I said, I, I'm always um, trying to develop myself professionally, you know, whether that's attending conferences, um, whether that is, um, you know, taking additional classes that I feel like will benefit me. Um, you know, I have thought about possibly pursuing a PhD in the future. Um, so, you know, if that ever comes about, I would, I would love to do something like that. Um, I'm sorry, what was the second part of the question again? Um, kind of where do you see, or what do you like to, what do you hope to accomplish in the future? Um, well, definitely in the future, you know, I would love to serve in some type of supervisory role. Um, you know, I, my passion is within higher education. Um, and I do feel like, you know, as an academic advisor, this has kind of highlighted a lot of my different uh, favorite favorite uh, focal areas within higher education. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I got my start as an undergraduate working in orientation and first year experience, obviously, you know, being a, a quest assistant, being a um, peer instructor and things like that. Um, so yeah, I, I really hope to eventually serve in a supervisory role, you know, within orientation, within first year experience, um, or even academic advising. Um, I, you know, I, that, that would definitely be a goal of mine in the future. Um, but yeah, outside of that, um, you know, just keep keep progressing. You know, keep keep being the best at the current time, being the best academic advisor I can be, um, and just making sure I'm fulfilling my job um, to the best of my ability. And I also wanted to ask you, what would you say are the three components of academic advising? Um, according to Radford's 2019 and 2020 advising handbook, um, advising is an intentional, pro intentional process that facilitates understanding of the meaning and purpose of higher education and fosters intellectual and personal development toward academic success and lifelong learning. Um, so what, were, what would you say are the three components of academic advising and how would you say they're different and how do they cohesively work together? Um, and actually, I, you know, thinking about it, I can't remember if I actually spelled out the acronym earlier, um, but when I said I attended the NACADA conference, um, so that's the National Association, or hold on one sec, National Association, um, sorry, one second. Okay, National Academic Advising Association. So I want to make sure I got that um, You're good. acronym completely um, appropriately. Um, so I, you know, the National Academic uh, Advising Association defines the values and core competencies for academic advising um, and what should be the focus. You know, the values they they list of caring, commitment, empowerment, inclusivity, um, integrity, professional professionalism, and respect. You know, I try to carry those out every day. Um, but kind of getting to the um, you know three components that you were talking about. Um, you know, those core competencies are broken down into three major components, um, that being conceptual, um, informational, and relational. Um, and, you know, these are kind of the different aspects that an academic advisor um, should carry out each day um, within their role of academic advising. Mm -hmm. um, so first, conceptual refers to um, concepts advisors must understand. So that's kind of, you know, what the role of advising is, um, advising strategies like flipped advising and things like that. Um, second is informational, um, which refers to uh, knowledge that advisors must master. Um, so that's like institutional knowledge. Um, so, you know, kind of knowing the courses and the course courses in and out, um, academic policies, you know, institutional history and things like that. Um, and then finally, relational um, refers to skills advisors, advisors must demonstrate, you know, such as inclusivity um, and, and promoting student understanding. Um, so I think all of these components are slightly different, but they do kind of work together, um, cohesively together, and that I can, I, and an ac a academic advisor should use them in their role every day. Um, my favorite component is probably the relational one. 
Um, and that's probably because um, you know, every advisor can always continue to improve every day um, in that area, no matter how much institutional knowledge or um, knowledge of student development theories and things like that that they may have to read. Um, I do feel like, um, you know, the, the relational component, it, like I said, is something every advisor can continue to work on um, no matter what. And I also wanted to ask you, um, in your LinkedIn biography, you were quoted saying, my career field and my love for my alma mater led me to my current position, academic advising at Radford University. Um, this job highlights my passion for first year experience, orientation, and mentoring students all in, all in one position. I hope one day to serve in a more supervisory, like you mentioned, role within higher education orientation or first year experience. So how would you describe your strengths and weaknesses as an academic advisor? And um, throughout your career, you served as a student intern for Mind Safety and Health Administration, um, a Quest assistant, peer instructor, graduate assistant, and a plethora of other positions. So would you say um, you're making strategic choices in the, in the trajectory of your career, or would you say you're being more spontaneous in your decision-making process? So answering your questions kind of chronologically there. Um, so I do believe that my strengths as an academic advisor are highlighted um, by my ability to, um, you know, kind of relate to students and support them in a very respectful way. Um, I feel like no matter what type of student I'm, I'm working with, I'm, I'm always striving to be inclusive and be respectful. Um, I think that students value, very much value my insight as a former Radford University student, uh, which kind of helps me with getting in, in with them, so to speak, to kind of, you know, getting to know them and having them build that trust with me. Um, which does feel like I help, which I feel like does help, um, you know, when I'm guiding them, you know, with appropriate courses, um, with utilizing campus resources, um, whether that be the Writing Center, the Harvey Knowledge Center. Um, you know, I feel like building that trust and respect with students is very important. Um, mm -hmm. Like they're, they're, you know, if, you, if you're respectful of students and they respect you, they're more likely to listen to you and kind of take your advice and things like that. Right. Um, and, you know, I, I like to believe that I don't necessarily have a detrimental weakness as an academic advisor. Um, I guess if I had like one weakness in particular um, that I had, you know, some of struggle with or have trouble with, um, it would be, you know, if a student asks a question, sometimes I maybe go a little in depth or um, kind of ramble a little bit, I guess. Um, so I could definitely just reel that in a little bit. But in that, I like to think I don't have too many detrimental weaknesses. Um, and answer the second half of your question. Um, so I do feel like my career path has been very much a progression. Um, you know, especially like as of late, but especially my career starting out. Um, I, my student internship with the Mind Safety and Health Administration um, was one of the very first jobs I had, and it was kind of just taught me a lot of professional skills within an office, um, and you know, kind of what's professional um, and things like that. Um, and I'd already pre previously spoken about how I um, was, or I can't remember if I mentioned this, but oh yeah, um, but Dr. Lurch, I was uh, encouraged to apply to be a peer instructor, um, mm -hmm. and I did so because the position interests me, and I you know did apply and eventually get the job. Um, I feel like that, that job very much opened the doorway for higher education and um, opened my eyes to the career field. Um, and it, you know, kind of got me going with everything within my career path now. Um, you know, all, all of the, um, you know, being a peer instructor um, led me to apply to be a lead peer instructor, uh, which I you know, applied for and was accepted to be. And then I actually, as a lead peer instructor, um, you know, I, I never actually applied to be a Quest assistant. Um, but they actually had a quest assistant who had backed out, you know, very last minute, I think like a few days before training was supposed to start. And mm -hmm. so I was reached out to, you know, hey, we need someone very nice last minute to be a quest assistant this summer. Um, you know, we think you'd be great for the job um, from, the new student, from the Office of New Student Programs. Um, and, you know, I was obviously very excited to accept it. it. It was something I had wanted to do and kind of, you know, the application date kind of got away from me and things like that. Um, so, you know, it, it, it was very much one of those things where, you know, being a peer instructor very much led me through all of these different student leadership positions that I had on campus. Right. Um, led me to the career where I'm at now. Um, and, you know, all those experiences within the Office of New Student Programs, um, now it's called the Office of New Student Family Programs. Um, I feel like that led me to apply to a variety of um, higher education graduate programs, um, especially with the guidance of the, you know, current and former uh, professionals within that office. They definitely had a, um, a good hand in mentoring me and kind of, um, you know, guiding me in my application process to those different institutions. Um, and, you know, they, when I applied and um, was eventually accepted to UVA, um, that presented me with the opportunity to be the graduate assistant at Piedmont Virginia Community College. Um, you know, as everyone, everyone in my program had a graduate assistantship either at UVA or at PVCC, um, which was the local community college in Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. um, so like I said, I do feel like it was one of those things where, you know, it, had I not applied to be a peer instructor, I might not be in the 
um, career in the current job that I'm in now, I do feel like it kind of had a very natural progression um, with me kind of finding the career field and realizing that it was um, my passion and kind of what I wanted to do. Um, you know, once I graduated from UVA, my job search and application process led me to applying and eventually accepting um, the cur current position I'm in now, obviously, um, with the as the assistant director of advising for the um, College of Education and Human Development. Um, and I do love the field of higher education. I've had an amazing um, few years in the field. I'm looking forward to um, what the future and what my career has in store for me. And I wanted to ask you, throughout your professional career, what would you say has been the greatest advice you've ever received and who gave you that advice? Oh, um, um, let me think here. I guess, uh, you know, and this is, um, Kind of cliche, I guess, um, but one of my professors within um, the higher education program at the University of Virginia, um, you know, go, if you're going into higher education, um, go into it because you're passionate about it. You know, it's, don't go into it because you want to make a ton of money. Uh, not that you can't make money, at, um, but, you know, definitely your, your interest in higher education should be because you're passionate about it. Um, you know, it, it, all, a lot of positions may not necessarily pay the highest. Um, so I would definitely say that, uh, you know, just kind of making sure you're passionate with what your career field is. And when it pertains to leadership, what are some goals or traits that you think make an effective leader or a great leader? And how would you describe yourself as a leader? Um, so I think a, a good leader kind of leads by example. Um, you know, I, I don't th I think a good leader doesn't try too hard to separate themselves um, from those that they are leading. Um, I think they very much level with them um, and, you know, kind of, um, they kind of lead by, like I said, just lead by example and have those characteristics. Um, that, that they want that those that they're leading to have. Um, and I do feel like I'm a leader because I'm able to um, kind of do that within my, um, you know, my advising case, case of as, uh, as well as my University 100 students. I um, mean, you know, kind of leading by example, making sure I'm on time to class, making sure I'm um, getting them things on time, posting grades on time and things like that. You know, things I would expect of them, um, I make sure I do myself. I don't want to, um, you know, expect something, of them, expect something of them that I wouldn't do myself. And even throughout your own career, as you were, as you mentioned, your progression in higher education has been, your career in, in higher education has been a progression. So how would you say um, if there ha has, there has a, have there ever been any instances where you've had to overcome adversity and how did you say you um, overcame them? Yes. Um, I mean, so, so there's, yeah, I mean, there, there's definitely um, times where I've had to overcome adversity, I would say. Um, you know, I, uh, let me think here for a second. You know, I, one example would be, um, you know, just kind of, um, I'm sorry, can you read the question one more time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I wanted to know throughout your career, has there ever been any instances where you've had to overcome adversity and how did you overcome it? Um, yeah, I, I, just, I just feel like kind of, um, you, know, you know, whenever I've been put in a situation where I'm like uncomfortable, or don't necessarily um, or uncomfortable. I don't necessarily, um, you know, wouldn't wouldn't necessarily like to be as prepared as I am. I feel like I'm very quick at thinking on my feet, um, mm -hmm. and just being very strategic and things like that. Um, you know, I can't think of one specific instance, um, but you know, throughout my graduate program at the University of Virginia, um, you know, sometimes and sometimes in University 100 classes, you know, when um, guest speakers things like that show up late. I'm thinking of, you know, like in, in front of a class or things like that, um, you know, kind of having to think of my feet and being able to come up with, um, you know, not necessarily lessons, but kind of icebreakers, whatever, maybe very quickly. Um, and just being able to be able to think very strategically. I'm thinking, you know, specifically at the University of Virginia in one of my classes, um, you know, we had, uh, we essentially were kind of supposed to do a workshop um, for everyone in our program. Um, and you know, our group of like five people was doing this, this workshop. Uh, and what we did was we had, um, you know, a professional at each table that was kind of giving advice to groups and they were kind of rotating things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, we had um, two professionals that end up not showing up. Um, so we had to think, you know, very quickly and kind of condense the groups and things like that. Um, and I'm also thinking, you know, sometimes at, at um, University 100 um, and things like that, you know, when we have guest speakers, um, you know, things come up, sometimes people run a little late. Um, so just kind of being able to, um, you know, interact with students effectively, you know, on my feet and not necessarily always having to be um, as prepared as possible. I mean, obviously, I like to be prepared for lessons, things like that. Um, but just having, you know, being being able to in, interact with students, um, you know, kind of on the fly, um, being able to conversate with them and things like that.
And for first year freshman students who are just now coming to Radford University, um, what can you tell them about the College of Education Human Development if they're interested in majoring in one of the courses at the college? And um, what are some upcoming events or let's say sessions that people can um, do for with the college or what's coming up with um, the College of Education Human Development? Um, well, I mean, I definitely think, um, you know, obviously with COVID and everything, um, you know, a, a lot of our events and things like that are online. Um, you know, if any student is interested in a major or program or anything like that in the University of Virginia, um, we have um, info sessions uh, for graduate programs, things like that. Um, but I would say, you know, one of the easiest ways is if you're interested in a specific major, um, pretty much every pretty much every program in our college has an intro course for their major, um, as do most majors, obviously. Um, but I really feel like our intro courses give a student an in-depth look at what that program is. Um, something in like, you know, intro to physical and education um, teaching, so ECU 210, a major of sport management, ECU 212. Um, you know, I feel like a lot of those, if a student's interested in a program, taking that intro class um, is one of the best ways you can kind of give some insight into if that program might be a good fit for you or not. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's how we get a lot of our students um, that end up, you know, you know, coming to college, not necessarily knowing, um, you know, recreation, parks and tourism is even a major you can do or things like that. Um, a lot of students will, you know, sign up for that intro course and they just fall in love with the program, fall in love with our college um, and very much just are, you know, love the faculty and the, the support that our faculty are able to give them. And for students, especially seniors who will be graduating later this semester, what advice would you give them on seeking employment opportunities when it pertains to writing effective cover letters, um, writing great resumes and uh, pitching um, job interviews with potential employers? Well, I would definitely say, you know, um, you know, as, as the advisor of me would say, I mean, I use the resources we have here on campus. You know, I, I think the Center for Career and Talent Development does an amazing job at helping students prepare um, for professional um, opportunities like that. I um, you know, they'll have like mock interviews and things like that. They'll go over their res your resume with you. I um, mean, you know, I just feel like using those resources we have on campus to prepare you for the professional world. Um, and, you know, if, if you're talking about a senior specifically within our college, um, you know, like I said, every, every, every program in our college um, has some type of experiential learning course, um, you know, whether that's an internship, whether that's actually teaching in the field, um, you know, student teaching experience, um, you know, different things like that. So I feel like a lot of those courses really do prepare students professionally for their fields, um, which is, you know, the, the whole point of why we have, why that's such an emphasis within our college. Um, we were, you know, within our college, we're not really just trying to teach you, we're trying to make sure you're prepared for your, for the workforce, for, for whatever your professional field is. Well, Davis, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with the Tardin and to do this interview. We really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Wes. It was an honor being on here and being able to answer some of these questions for you. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. Bye. Bye.